Since its founding in 1890, Whitworth University has remained a Christian institution of higher learning dedicated to the education of mind and heart. Although George F. Whitworth established Whitworth College, as it was known then, as a Presbyterian institution, he made it clear that Whitworth was and should always be, and I'm quoting, non-sectarian, opening its doors to all lovers of truth and learning, end quote. Over the decades, Whitworth's religious ethos and commitments have been continuously shaped by three primary theological descriptors or identities, reformed, evangelical, and ecumenical. No one of these identities taken alone captures the heart and soul of Whitworth, but taken as a whole, these identities can and do inform and guide the university's ongoing reflection on its relationship to Christ's church, to the academy, and to the larger culture. Concurrent with the Board of Trustees' decision in April 2013 to at once affirm and maintain the university's relationship with the Presbyterian Church USA, and also to broaden its relationships to other denominations and expressions of the Christian Church, the Board also directed the university's administration to lead the Whitworth community in a series of conversations about the theological identities upon which the university relies. The purpose of these conversations, as the board directed, is to provide a venue wherein students, staff, and faculty could explore the tensions and complementarities existing within and between Whitworth's theological identities. To hear from and consider diverse voices from within the Whitworth community about how these re identities relate to the university's mission and to the responsibilities of students and employees and to explore how the Whitworth community could live into these identities in the future, given the opportunities and challenges deriving from a rapidly changing denominational, church, and cultural landscape. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from four of our community members as they reflect upon Whitworth's ecumenical identity. Last November, the first of our events explored Whitworth's reformed identity and Presbyterian affiliation and just last month, I hosted a similar conversation here in this chapel that focused on Whitworth's evangelical identity. Those presentations are available in both video and audio podcasts if you're interested from the Whitworth website. And as we conclude this colloquy series tonight, I want, want to once again thank all of our participants, all of those who have presented uh, not only tonight but in previous sessions and also to all of you uh, who are attending the, these sessions and are contributing in your important ways. Thank you very much. Tonight's keynote address will be delivered by Dr. Adrian Teo. Three respondents have graciously agreed to deliver their reflections on Dr. Teo's address. They are Dr. Jerry Sitzer, student Santa Hughes, and staff member Chris Eichhorst. After all four of our presenters have spoken, we will have a moderated panel conversation with questions from the audience, so please, as you all listen to these uh, conversations, be thinking about what questions you'd like to ask. So now let me briefly introduce our speakers for this evening in the order in which they'll be speaking. Dr. Adrian Teo, our keynote speaker, is Associate Professor of Psychology, and he joined the Whitworth faculty in 1997. Adrian was born and raised in Singapore and has been living in the United States since 1988. Adrian received his PhD and MA in child psychology from the University of Minnesota and his BS in psychology from Oregon State University. Adrian has been described by his colleagues as having very deep commitments to both his Christian faith and to his family. He is also known for thoughtfully integrating Christian faith and concepts into the study of psychology, and he has deeply influenced the faith journeys of many of our students at Whitworth. Adrian is an avid soccer fan, I'm told. Adrian also loves chocolate chip cookies, I'm also told. <laughs> and rumor has it that whenever Adrian gives his classes an assignment, he somehow manages to include chocolate chip cookies. Um, Adrian has, and this is his word, has joyously been married for almost 23 years to his wife, Tessa, and they have five wonderful children ranging from elementary to college ages. Dr. Jerry Sitzer grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He attended Hope College and later Fuller Theological Seminary, where he earned his MDiv degree. 
Jerry served as associate pastor at Emanuel Reformed Church in Paramount, California, and for four, year, for four years there, and then as chaplain at Northwestern College in uh, Orange City, Iowa, for six years before returning to school, this time at the University of Chicago to earn his PhD in the history of Christianity under Martin Marty. He's been teaching in the theology department at Whitworth since 1989. Jerry sits on many committees and boards at Whitworth and in the community, including serving as the chair of the theology department, the certification for ministry program, and the MA in theology program, which he helped to establish in 2008. He also leads a theology reading group for local pastors here in Spokane. Dr. Sitzer has won numerous awards and honors and has written extensively. One of his books, A Grace Disguised, How the Soul Grows Through Loss, is a bestseller and has been translated into 20 languages. Married to Pat since 2010, he has three married children, two married stepchildren, and two grandchildren. And when speaking with Jerry, it's evident that he sees the classroom and student relationships as central to his calling. He often says that it is this calling that has sustained him in joyful service at Whitworth for the past 25 years. St. Hughes is a junior from Salt Lake City, Utah, majoring in Communication Studies and Theology. Saina is a proud resident assistant in East Hall, and her academic accomplishments have earned her a spot on, Whitworth, on the Whitworth University Laureate Society. Saina has served in many capacities during her three years at Whitworth. She is currently a member of the Student Philanthropy Council and works for the Whitworth Phonathon with the Office of Institutional Advancement. She was a small group coordinator in Baldwin Jenkins, and a Whitworthian staff writer for two years. Last summer, Saina participated in Whitworth's pilot summer ministry internship program with First Presbyterian Church in Snohomish, Washington. While there, Saina was able to work with the youth, doing everything from children's sermons to youth lock-ins. Other ministry opportunities included visiting the homebound, participating in worship on Sundays, doing administrative work, and most memorably, she says, she preached for the first time, which she absolutely loved. Saina enjoys the outdoors, being with good friends and family, a strong cup of coffee, I'm told, and writing and blogging for fun. She's an avid Oakland Raiders football fan. I would have never guessed that, Saina. <laughs> She's a dead-eye free-throw shooter. I've watched her shoot the three-pointers at the halftime of Wilbur Pirates basketball game, and she makes them. And she has a particular appetite for ice cream and Oreo cookies, I'm told. <laughs> Um, when asked about her career aspirations, Saina replied, and I'm quoting, I am the full embodiment of a double major at a liberal arts school. I don't want to have to choose, she says. <laughs> the bottom line, she says, is that I, know, that I know I love God and I know I love people. And no matter what my next step or steps may be, I'm excited to be glorifying God by serving others. And last but certainly not least, Chris Eichhorst is a self-proclaimed Air Force brat Moving frequently as a child, but he claims Abilene, Texas as his hometown. Chris joined Whitworth University in 2012 as uh, Whitworth's Director of Facility Services after retiring as an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel from Fairchild Air Force Base. Chris oversees the daily operations of our physical campus as well as participates in the planning for our future needs here at Whitworth. Chris's previous work experiences include serving as commander of the Air Force ROTC detachment at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, serving as a member of the Texas A&M Corps of Cadets, which is hard for me to say as a Baylor Bear, <laughs> <laughs> and as deputy to the division chief for the test and evaluation resources and infrastructure division at the Pentagon in Virginia. Chris earned a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Texas A&M a Master's in Engineering Management from WSU Spokane, and the Master of Science in Systems Engineering from the Air Force Institute of Technology. Chris says that the best thing about being at Whitworth is working with like-minded, purpose-driven people. And he also enjoys the challenge of helping to create a more beautiful, maintainable, and cost-efficient campus. Chris is married to Adina, a Clarkston, Washington native, and he has uh, twin eight-year-old boys. His hobbies include cycling, running, basketball, and coaching his sons. So as you can see tonight, we have a wonderful panel. Would you all please join me in welcoming these who are here. Good evening, everybody.
He is risen. Hallelujah. I thank you, President Taylor, uh, for the honor of this invitation to offer my reflections on ecumenism. And also thank you, Sena, Chris, Jerry, for your thoughtful responses. Uh, Abraham Lincoln once paraphrased Proverbs 1728 when he wrote, better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. <laughs> I have never fully understood why diversity should always lead to richness, as some have claimed. In one sense, I fully appreciate the fact that different shades and colors can contribute and come together in a way that brings out a beautiful image. Just as it's beautiful to see a team of differently skilled people work together to bring about a wonderful product. However, when it comes to areas of truth and morality, diversity quickly becomes another word for chaos, partial truth, and even falsehoods. So it is yes and no. Yes, we must embrace diversity in a certain sense, but no, we cannot embrace a diversity of truth and moral values, even in the name of ecumenism. Sometime around the first week of Jan term 2002, I received a notice to immediately visit my primary care doctor on a matter so serious that my wife should come along. Now, for several months earlier, I had been experiencing a double vision whenever I looked to my left. And after repeated eye exams, my eyes were found to be functioning as normal. As unlikely as it seemed at that time, I was advised to do a brain MRI, even with the expectation that nothing unusual would be found, given that I had no other symptoms, such as headaches and dizziness. The visit to the doctor came just a couple of days after the MRI. The diagnosis, a brain tumor that was right next to my pituitary gland. Here I was, a father of four, plus a baby on the way, at the tender age of mid-30s, <laughs> having to wrestle with the possibility of leaving a widow behind with no source of income. It was around then that the Whitworth University community revealed its true form and colors. The form and colors of a, like a beautiful, simple glass window, just like the one in this chapel. Simple and clear. Decorated with a few lines and colors to form a cross in the middle, the cross of the crucified man-god who gave his life so that I may live. Simply and clearly, the Whitworth community stepped up with offers of support, of time free from teaching responsibilities, of money to fund those very times of my absence because of treatment, and of touching words and loving actions to help carry the weight of worries that I had to bear. And though there were a few lines of regulations that I had to conform to, they were subtly colored with streaks of hope and a bright expectation of recovery. As clear as the window was, the Whitworth community too was a clear sign of the cross, which gave me a renewed hope of everlasting life. The supportive actions of a predominantly Caucasian, American, evangelical Protestant community towards an Asian, non-American, Catholic man represented a sign of the beginning of a true Christian ecumenical spirit. Basically, it is the willingness to embrace a person as person first, then to see the, that person as brother or sister in Christ next. Thank you, again, with was University. He was known as the Hatchet Man, the special counsel to the president and a convicted felon. These words describe a man I had deeply admired since the early days of my Christian walk, 
and who first taught me that to love God is to obey his commands, no matter what the cost. Charles Colson. As founder of Prison Fellowship, he co-authored a 1994 document entitled Evangelicals and Catholics Together, which was signed by several leading evangelical and Catholic scholars. Whatever inadequacies one may see in that document, nevertheless, it was a sincere attempt to bring separated groups of faithful Christians together as witnesses of Christ. It was Mr. Colson who taught the new convert that I was that to love God actively is primarily to perform acts of ongoing obedience. It was Mr. Colson who once wrote that what we do flows from who we are. Who are we, Whitworth University? The root meaning of the word ecumenism in Latin is universal. Commonly, it refers to all the activities and initiatives towards mutual understanding or cooperation among Christians in the universal church. The goal of ecumenism is to promote Christian unity. It may be thought of in the primary sense of church or denominational unity. In this sense, Christians must, quote, profess together the same truth about the cross and precisely with a view to proclaiming the gospel to men and women of every people and nation, end quote. These were the words penned by the late Pope John Paul II. The truth of the good news must remain undivided, even though its expression may take slightly different forms. There is a cartoon that showed a church on the outside with its doors wide open and a sign reading, Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. Through the doors of the church, a column of clergy were making their exit in pairs. The first wore a mitre and carried a bishop's staff. His partner wore a clergy suit and clerical collar. They were followed closely by a clergyman with a very tweedy jacket. His female partner appeared to be singing hardly. At the, next came a, a clergyman wearing shorts and what appeared to be beach attire, and so on. At the head of the recessional, the bishop with the staff turned to his partner and says, see you next year. Now, for many of us Catholics, praying for unity happened just about as often as praying for the guy who cut us off on the highway. Is ecumenism simply a set of activities that we engage in once or twice every year as a good but optional matter for Christians? Or is it primarily a call to obedience to the will of Christ? Do we engage each other with a both a firm and uncompromising grasp on our convictions and yet with the willingness to listen and understand alternative, well-reasoned, and faith-guided interpretations of Scripture. If there is but one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all, then it is imperative that we must actively seek unity among Christians. The unity of all Christians is ultimately the will of God. For Jesus prayed that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The English journalist G.K. Chesterton once noted that a good argument must be about truth. Act a humanism that is just about negotiating differences rather than about truth, discovering truth, is forgery. As an institution of higher learning committed to discovering truth wherever it may be found, we must have the courage to engage in frank conversations about conflicting ideas over who has the authority to interpret scripture, the doctrine of justification, or the roles of women at home and in the church. We reject nothing that is true and holy. 
As with any good and sincere endeavors, however, sin is crouching at the door. The 18th century German scientist G.C. Lindenberg noted that the most dangerous of all falsehood is the slightly distorted truth. The sincere attempts at ecumenism must not seek unity at the expense of truth. For or, taint, or be tainted with the stains of compromise. The Christian convictions, for example, in the triune God, in the hypostatic union of Christ as both fully divine and fully human, or in the saving work of Christ apart from any human merit, are some of the unchanging and unchangeable merit tenets. There can be no true unity when the truth itself is corrupted, for such attained truth <coughs> cannot set us free. Boston College philosopher Peter Kreeft wrote that, the we wrote that Western civilization's past era was their insensitivity to the soft virtues such as compassion and care of the weak. The era of today, on the other hand, is our insensitivity to the hard virtues of courage, self-discipline, self-denial, chastity, and honesty. We must avoid both errors altogether. It is easy for the modern person to fall into a false ecumenism that seeks unity at the expense of truth, led primarily by his or her commitment to the soft virtues at the expense of the hard one. Without denying the real and difficult differences in theological perspectives, doctrines, and morals of our members, we must engage in meaningful and enlightening conversations well aware that truth does not impose itself except, quote, by virtue of its own truth as it makes its entrance into the mind at once, quietly, and with power, end quote. Dignitatis Humanae, the Second Vatican Council. I am reminded again of the words of Chesterton who wrote that there is one angle at which to stand upright, but many angles at which to fall. Now, the Christian life is about self-surrender to the one who is Lord and truth, rather than self-aggrandizement, self-satisfaction, or even, as some have claimed, self-realization. Our personal subjective values must ha may have to be sacrificed at the altar of truth in Jesus Christ. In matters of doctrines and morals, the members of Whitworth University will most likely disagree. We must acknowledge our theological differences while continuing to seek truth with the help of the Holy Spirit. We must each try to do our best to understand the disagreements of other members so that we may re-examine our own beliefs and either stand or change our grounds. We, shall, we will continue to disagree, and yet, as a community of disciples, we must continue to pray for the unity that our Lord desires without disrupting the order that God has willed for his creation. This form of ecumenism of bringing unity in fundamental doctrines, however, remains primarily the call and work of the church. The generous support of this community in my battle with cancer overwhelmed me, so much so that I puzzled and asked why I the outsider was openly embraced by these other people. In my first year here at Whitworth, I was constantly bothered by an overly friendly colleague who would persistently and regularly show up at my office to pray with me. It was somewhat of an annoyance, but then again, the Lord works in mysterious ways and I am most grateful for his gift of Jack. <laughs> Those meetings eventually led to the formation of a small men's group, a group of four faculty members who would get together once a week to pray for each other and to support one another. Jack Burns from Leadership Studies, Jim Edwards uh, from Theology, Toby Schwartz from Athletics, and I, the psychologist, the only Catholic person who did not quite fit in. 
Over the course of about a decade, we met with each other weekly, sharing ideas, sharing theological differences, and yet still offering acceptance and friendship towards toward one another in spite of the fundamental disagreement. We all knew what bound us together. Jesus Christ our Lord and a common mission. In a secondary sense, ecumenism, understood as pursuing common goals and attaining practical cooperation, is properly applied to non-ecclesiastical communities. For a non-church institution of higher learning like Whitworth University, Ecumenism is more appropriately thought of in this other sense. A unity that is expressed through a common mission by people who hold to a common set of core, non-negotiable Christian beliefs. Such, such a unity may exist on a less profound and perhaps less integrated level, so that we may be one, not as one body of Christ, but as one body of disciples sharing common beliefs and common goals. A proper ecumenical dialogue, for example, might begin with a discussion of the application of the gospel to moral conduct. The reality is that in a community of Christians of different traditions, we each understand the moral teaching of the gospel differently from one another. We may not even agree on the solutions to the problems of modern society. None, nevertheless, we share the same conviction that we do these all as witnesses of the same good news. We will obey the Apostle Paul who reminded us that, giving, that whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We shall discuss and we shall debate. We shall argue and we shall disagree. But we will never do these out of pride that we could never be wrong, but out of conviction that faith and reason will guide us. This is what it means to have a courageous conversation. We must be willing to put our good reputations on the line. As Chesterton once wrote, courage is almost a contradiction in terms. It means a strong desire to live, taking form of a readiness to die. The striving for common goals based on common beliefs will guide us in this effort towards ecumenism. It is an attempt at some level of unity, albeit imperfectly. Christians, even though divided on doctrinal issues, can nevertheless work effectively together towards common endeavors, such as de developing an appreciation for the fundamental dignity of the human person at every stage of its development, the application of gospel principles to social, social life, the advancement of the arts and sciences in the pursuit of true beauty and truth, and the search for various solutions to relieve the afflictions of humanity, such as poverty and hunger, and clean water and clean air. Perhaps for this reason, the sharing of a common mission, that I, the outsider, became a tr truly a member of the community. Now, as a full member of the Whitworth community, I am blessed to encounter people carrying thoughts that I have never thought of. I have had the great fortune of both challenging another's view and being challenged as well. I fully share the sentiment captured by the words of the great biochemist, Melvin Cohn. I am grateful to be in a profession where the realization of being wrong is equivalent to an increase in knowledge. Chesterton and his new bride went on what they described as a second honeymoon. He later recalled in his autobiography, I saw a passing omnibus labeled Hanwell, and feeling this to be an appropriate omen, for Hanwell was the location of a notorious lunatic asylum. We boarded it and left it somewhere at a stray station, which I entered and asked the man in the ticket office where the next train went to. He uttered a pedantic reply, where do you want it to go? And I uttered the profound and philosophical rejoinder, wherever the next train goes to. It seemed like it went to Slough, which may seem to be singular taste even in a train. However, we went to Slough, 
and from there set out walking with even less notion of where we were going. Where we are going will be determined by what we are guided by. If Whitworth University is to be truly a community of disciples of Christ, it has to begin with an unwavering commitment in each of its members to the gospel without exception. Yes, we should invite people of other faiths or no faith to dialogue. Yes, it is well that we continue to invite non-Christian students into our community to share with them the good news. But for us to remain a true community, we must be committed and guided by this very same gospel of love. Only then is it possible for a deep appreciation of one another. We, as a community, must be constant in our vigilance to avoid words and actions which do not represent the deeply held beliefs of our fellow Christians. Instead, we must strive for a more adequate understanding of the respective doctrines of our fellow Christians, their history, their spiritual practices, and their liturgical life. Guided by the gospel of love, each of us is then able to reach beyond the I-thou relationship to the we relationship, such, as the, such that the thou no longer simply contributes to a fuller expression of myself, but rather the thou becomes a specific other, another human person created also in the same image and likeness of God. Only then, can the relationship become truly reciprocal such that a human community grows out of it. To be guided by the gospel of love is to willingly give up one's comfort and status, one's pride and one's prejudices, and to uphold the dignity that is present in every irreplaceable and unrepeatable person made in the image and likeness of God. For he who does not love does not know God. Over time, embraced by a genuine community, united to a common mission, the outsider that I came was came to see that he was not looking at the chapel cross from the outside. No, he was looking at the cross on the inside as one of them. The mission he embraces is the same one that every other member of this community embraces. And so, I have learned a little about diversity and why it can re lead to richness. The richness comes about when there is a genuine unity in a set of uncompromising common beliefs and a common mission. To be reformed Whitworth, as Kathy Storm has noted, is to stand on a landmark, identified by an affirmation of the authority of scripture, God's sovereignty, and a reaching outwards. To be always reforming may require us to re-examine our doctrines in the spirit of unity and commit, sorry, commitment to God's truth. To be evangelical is to share the good news while conforming our very own lives to living the truth. To, be, to evangelize, we must be willing to give up our personal goals, desires, and reputations for the sake of building the kingdom of God. And finally, to be ecumenical is to seek unity based on the same truth that guides each one of us. We must obey the command of our Lord to love our neighbors as ourselves and to love our enemies. We must not surrender to the false worldviews of our time, but rather uphold the inviolable dignity of every single person we encounter and yet also recognizing that their dignity demand a higher standard of living their lives, not just for personal satisfaction, but for others. We shall begin the hard work of healing the past wounds through humility and mutual forgiveness. We shall admit weakness in our capacities for understanding the other because we are all fallen. We shall continue our practice of regular times set aside for common prayer so that we can come together to call upon the help and mercy of Christ our Lord. And finally, we shall continue this dialogue. 
which is not merely an exchange of ideas, but also an exchange of gifts, in order to discover the unfathomable, unfathomable riches of truth. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate the opportunity to serve as a respondent to Adrian's paper on the meaning and implications of uh, the ecumenical identity of Whitworth. I've long admired Adrian as a Catholic brother at this largely Protestant institution. We're also neighbors, so we see each other quite often. As I read his paper, I was moved by his reflections on his battle against cancer and celebrated his commitment to the truth as embodied in Jesus. Our understanding of ecumenical, our negotiation of the differences among us and our experience of unity must be rooted in the faith once delivered to the saints, and Adrian made that so very clear. His comments maintain gospel focus from beginning to end. The word ecumenical is derived from the Greek term oikumene, which means the whole inhabited world. The Romans arrogantly assumed that its massive empire unified and ruled over the whole inhabited world, with Caesar serving as its earthly lord. Christians adopted the term for their own purposes. Their new movement created a different kind of empire, as we all know. Not of army and commerce, wealth and education, but of ordinary people living across the ancient world who chose to join a very different people and follow a very different Lord. Christians created a, a new oikumenon. As the so-called letter to Diognetus states, my students will recognize this immediately, Christians, and I quote, live in their own countries, but only as aliens. They have a share in everything as citizens, and endure everything as foreigners. Every foreign land is their fatherland, and yet for them, every fatherland is a foreign land. Such is the basic meaning of ecumenical. Our experience of the ecumenical church, however, does not seem to fit that idea and ideal very well. There are over 35,000 separate Christian bodies scattered around the world today, organized into some 150 major families, the reform being one of them. Forced unity does not strike me as a good solution to overcome these massive uh, divisions, nor does ideological pluralism, nor does bland tolerance. What should we believe and do in light of this huge problem? As you probably know, the church has been struggling with disunity and division for centuries. The unity of the church, such as it was, suffered its first trauma in 1054, when East and West split. It suffered a second trauma during the Reformation, when Protestant and Catholic divided. Protestants have been dividing ever since. Many, uh, more recently, Christians have tried to overcome these divisions. Evangelical revivals, for example, spawned hundreds of voluntary societies to do the work of missions and service, which united Christians across denominational lines in a common purpose. Later on, Christians formed various ecumenical organizations to accomplish the same ends. These efforts represented, in my mind, genuine attempts to rediscover what ecumenical means and requires. Since Vatican II, the Catholic Church has emerged as an important voice in this conversation, though never compromising its deepest convictions and august history. Lately, the Eastern Orthodox Church has joined in as well, offering the ballast of its ancient tradition. The stakes seem higher now to me. The Church is truly global and overwhelmingly non-Western. It does, in fact, encompass the entire inhabited world and speaks in hundreds, actually thousands of languages. There is no more diverse group of people on planet Earth than the church. But the world is more hostile to Christianity, too. Perhaps persecution will accomplish, once again, 
what it did so many centuries before. We at Whitworth represent one small part of this global church. What does it mean for us to be ecumenical? The church was birthed in Jerusalem. Soon the church grew beyond those boundaries, reaching Samaritans and Gentiles, which raised a big question. Should these converts be required to become Jews first and thus join the dominant group? The leaders of the church differed in their opinion on this issue. So they met for the first church council in Jerusalem. This is recorded in Acts 15. There they decided that Gentile Christians should show respect to Jews and obey the Jewish moral law, but they did not have to become Jews first. In short, no circumcision and no kosher laws and the like. Conversion to Jesus Christ was the only conversion required. Obedience to Jesus Christ, the only pathway to follow. Adrian mentioned the centrality of truth. He was right to do so. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the whole world. He is God become human. He came for all. He suffered for all. He died for all. He rose for all. He invites and embraces all. He requires only one response, summed up in the early apostolic message, repent and believe. Paul announced, as Adrian pointed out, that there is one body and one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. How can this be so? Paul used the historic dispute between Jew and Gentile to make his point. He conceded that Gentiles were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise without God and without hope in the world. But Jesus came for those Gentiles, for those who were far off like the prodigal son, as well as for Jews, for those who are near, for all need the gift of divine salvation, regardless of past and pedigree and performance. How did Jesus accomplish this? In his death, Paul says, he broke down the dividing wall of hostility that humans erect to make one group feel superior to another, and thus opened up a new way to God, turning two into one and making enemies into friends. Paul did not say Jesus Christ erased the differences between the two groups. He simply defanged them and diminished their significance. They could no longer serve as the means of superiority and domination. We are all outsiders. Jesus Christ makes us all insiders, which allows us to continue to be who we are as, say, Jew and Gentile, only in the way that is shaped by the gospel. When we come to the Lord's table, we bring nothing with us except our raw need. There we receive grace in Jesus Christ. There also we find each other. It is only in this gospel that the word ecumenical has meaning. A few years ago, my boys and I traveled to Costa Rica to visit my daughter, Catherine, who was living there at the time. One morning, I took a walk and happened upon a, a small church. The pastor and his wife were outside working. I stopped for a brief moment and watched them. They noticed me and looked a little suspicious of this obvious American. I smiled, pointed at the cross affixed to the church, and then touched my heart. They understood immediately, came over to embrace me, and invited me to join them as if I now belonged to the family. We did our best to communicate. I knew six or seven words of Spanish, <laughs> but it didn't really matter. We had communicated enough. The cross was the only language we needed to make ourselves perfectly clear. 
In my mind, the only threat to the ecumenical character of Whitworth's identity is not denominational difference and division, which hardly seems relevant these days, especially in the Pacific Northwest. It is the threat of an alien ideology that makes the gospel subservient to something else, as if the gospel were a kind of religious accessory. That is what happened during the German church struggle. Nazi ideology eclipsed the gospel. The church became subservient to the culture, Christians subservient to Aryan. Today it is no different. Threats still encroach on the centrality of the gospel and on the ecumenical identity of the church. There is no shortage of examples. I am equally bothered by ideologies on the right and on the left. For example, the gospel of capitalist prosperity on the right, on the one hand, and the gospel of pluralism and relativism, relativism on the other. Ideologies demand our ultimate allegiance. New Caesars require us to bow the knee. New dividing walls are erected to make one group feel superior to another. The Barman Declaration spoke to the German situation some 80 years ago. It still speaks today. Barman warned that the church should never surrender her message, witness, and way of life to an alien ideology or political system. Once she does, she is no longer the church. Instead, she becomes a tool of, say, the Republican Party, or academic fashion, or self-help religion, or whatever else demands her allegiance. The church is truly herself, truly ecumenical, when she belongs first and foremost to Christ alone, her Lord. Thank you. Well, I'll be honest that when Beck asked me to do this last fall, I wasn't as concerned with the word ecumenism as I was with the word colloquy. <laughs> what the heck is a colloquy? <laughs> And though it wasn't an entirely unfamiliar word, I thought it was one of those that I should probably look up just to make sure I knew what I was talking about. And when I did so, I was surprised how simple the definition was. A conversation. Not an argument. Not a debate. Not a competition. A conversation. And as I have wrestled with and prayed over these thoughts, I have concluded it would be discrediting the spirit of ecumenism for me to try to pull people to any side. Certainly there are times when this kind of persuasive appeal is appropriate, but I want to be clear. My goal is not to rebut, compete, or convince you of any one proper ideology. This might be more uncomfortable for me than for anyone else. I'm an arguer and a competitor. In fact, I love nothing more than being right. <laughs> but if I have learned anything on my Christian walk, I have learned that I am actually not always right. And none of us are. Somewhere along the line, we have all been painfully and desperately Wrong, and it is by God's grace alone that we are set right. Because of that core truth, I stand here now quite humbled and unqualified with the hope of encouraging the Whitworth community to unite under the grace that got us here to begin with. As St. Augustine put it, the church is a whore but she's my mother. Mind you, Augustine was writing this in the fourth century, in the days before Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic, before Luther and Calvin and Whitfield and Wesley, in the days before colloquies on theological identities. But perhaps Augustine's words are even more relevant today. Sadly, I think it's the first part of Augustine's statement that is easier to grasp than the second. The church is a whore. Sure, it's not exactly reverent language. Let's remember that these are his words, not mine. But that's his point. 
We as the church have been unfaithful. And chances are it's not hard for us to think of examples of Christian disunity or times when Christians have behaved inappropriately in the public eye. But the second part of that line, but she's my mother. When a child is born, a mother is a source of sustenance. And as that child grows, a mother is a foundation of love, comfort, and teaching. The thing about a blood relation so close as a mother is that there is never anything we can do to separate from her. She is always ours, and we are always hers. Furthermore, many mothers have more than one child. I myself come from a family of three. I am the oldest and have two younger sisters, one of whom is here tonight. And when we were growing up, it was not uncommon for us to bicker over who was the favorite or which one mom and dad loved more. And our parents would tell us again and again that we were loved equally. But somehow that would get ignored the next time someone tattled on somebody else or the youngest got out of doing chores again. Hopefully we'll see this example come full circle later. If the church, church with a capital C, is a universal institution commissioned by God, if the church is founded on the redeeming sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ, if we indeed have all fallen short of the glory of God and are in need of his grace, then get comfortable because we're family. All under the lordship, say the parenthood of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Over the centuries though, church has become a word that describes not just the big C church, but little churches. Perhaps you go to one, be it called Lutheran or Presbyterian, Baptist, Pentecostal, non-denominational. And though we have butchered this time and again, I'd like to think that rather than these ideologies being long-lost friends, they're actually closer to siblings. Maybe there are some cousins sprinkled in because we all understand what it's like to have those distant relatives that may drive us especially crazy. But they're still family nonetheless. As Christians, we share blood. Blood spilled for us on a cross. And just as a child cannot escape the blood relation to his or her mother, if we call ourselves Christians, we are under the care of the universal church, whether we like it or not. Not unlike my own family, and probably many other families, these siblings, as we're calling them, rooted in theological identities, have bickered and at times torn each other to shreds, often forgetting that we have much more in common than we do differences. Around the same time I transitioned to Whitworth, as is characteristic of many young adults, I began to feel this odd, warm feeling toward my younger sisters. These people that I had bickered with my entire life, I all of a sudden missed them or needed them? Our ecumenical call as Christians is to grow up and appreciate one another, understanding that we are forced to be blood related so we might as well be friends. Celebrating our differences, but resting in the grace of a savior who loves us all equally as his one holy ecumenical church. Whitworth is a place where these theological identities collide and coincide. And though Whitworth itself is not a church, it is a servant of the church. And by claiming the name of Christ, Whitworth too is a part of this church family. Should I have everyone in this room explain what type of Christian theological background they come from or what they identify with now? I am fairly confident I would get a vast array of responses only to be outnumbered by the classic, can I pick more than one? Ecumenism is being able to pick more than one because Jesus has already picked all of us. 
Ecumenism can be an easy word to misunderstand. It doesn't mean we must learn to see exactly eye to eye with the colleague or classmate with whom we disagree. And I'll argue it's not the same as non-denominational. Ecumenism embraces convictions and inclinations, fully acknowledging the differences, but seeking to unite above them. Ecumenism is not ignorant. It does not turn a blind eye to the parts of theology it would rather not see and show favoritism to other parts. As Dr. Teo mentioned, the word ecumenical comes from the same root as the word universal. Ecumenism understands the big picture. It assumes the fact right now we stand in solidarity with a persecuted church in Southeast Asia and a suffering church in Palestine. It acknowledges that yes, we are indeed related to those Christians who sometimes open their mouth when we'd really rather than not. It acknowledges that though Whitworth was found as a reformed institution and has since taken on significant evangelical influence, those identities, among others, do not need to be mutually exclusive. Every Tuesday and Thursday morning, this room fills with students, staff, and faculty of all areas and departments on campus for a brief 30 minutes of worship. And Whitworth Chapel is a highlight of my weeks. I find it to be a consistent place of joy, grace, and fulfillment. But on Thursdays in particular, we celebrate the sacrament of communion together. As I thought of examples of a humanism in my own life and at Whitworth, I found this one to be especially sacred. Our world is made up of meticulous categories. And for a brief couple of minutes each Thursday morning, I get to watch those categories disintegrate. I watch Whitworthians of all positions and walks of life come to the Lord's table. Roman Catholics and Charismatics, by the book Presbyterians, and the loosest denominationally unaffiliated Christians, doubter and lifelong believer, female clergy, devout traditionalists, PhD, undergraduate, African American and Asian, gay and straight, Republican and Democrat, all together for one reason, to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I don't know of a phenomenon like this outside of Christianity. So I soak it in each Thursday and thank God that his love doesn't stop at a social trend or theological tradition. I believe Whitworth University has an ecumenical spirit worth sharing with the greater Christian community around us. As a university, we have an arena to equip students to honor God, follow Christ, and serve humanity. Notice that statement doesn't go, honor God, follow Christ, serve humanity, and attend whatever church of such and such denomination, read all of so-and-so's theological theses, and memorize this particular book of the Bible. No, our mission in itself is ecumenical. It seeks to output devout followers of Jesus around the globe, all persuasions and divisions secondary. In conclusion, let's remember that while theological identities have blossomed, changed, and faded, Jesus Christ has not. This is true for many of us personally, as well as for us as the Whitworth community. What Whitworth hasn't wavered in is its identity as a Christian institution. We may walk a narrow ridge, but we remain unapologetic about our dedication to Jesus Christ. We don't try to domesticate that or systematize our Christian mission. We are ecumenical. We celebrate the whole family coming together, quirky relatives included. We understand that there is not a person in attendance tonight who God didn't intentionally and lovingly create and come to save. These are the reasons why I've chosen to call this place home. Should traditions fade and affiliation change, may Jesus Christ, the Lord of Reformed theology, 
evangelicalism, ecumenism, and many other branches and traditions always be the cornerstone of this university. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for your thoughtful presentation on ecumenism. After your reference to Abraham Lincoln's paraphrase of Proverbs 17, 28, my insecurity about the knowledge of the subject prompted me to avoid speaking foolishly. I prefer to be silent, but after two years of growing in the Whitworth community, I am compelled to continue this growth by stepping out way beyond my comfort zone and contributing to this important conversation. So here it goes. I've never really given ecumenism much thought until I was given this, this assignment. This new guy view of this identity is the basis for my response. I'm a Roman Catholic, a cradle Catholic. In fact, who knew that, in fact, who knew that the responsibility of attending church and Sunday school, CCD as we call it, weekly and receiving the sacraments was not up for debate. Because I was raised Catholic, in my home I was not encouraged to question why we believe what we do. I was told merely to accept it on faith alone. In my family, belief was based mostly on tradition. Perhaps that is one reason this response is more of a heartfelt response than a well-researched document taking a strong position on one side of this issue of ecumenism. Being raised in a military family as a military brat, with most of my formative years in the midst of the Bible Belt in Alabama and Texas, and with my peers coming from the Baptist Church and Church of Christ traditions, I felt like an outsider. As a matter of fact, in the ninth grade during a small group meeting I, I attended, the conversation was steered toward religion and Christianity, and it came up that I was Catholic. After in my admi admission, maybe my confession, a classmate told me that Catholics aren't Christian. I chalked this up to my classmate's small world view, but for some reason it has stayed with me as a profound moment. I know that Catholics are not only Christians, but I was taught that the Catholics were the first organized Christian church. I don't mean to spark a debate. I am no theologian, and I do not wish to argue over who is first or who is right. Sometimes the focus of ecumenism is to discuss and understand the differences of other denominations. That has its merits, but as Adrian attested, all those Christians are rooted in fundamental truths, and this should be our focus. Through college and into adulthood, my professional experiences did not promote religious discussions. As an Air Force officer for more than 22 years, I lived my Christian life at home and at church, but not freely in the workplace. And I definitely never opened a staff meeting with a prayer. Don't misunderstand me. The Air Force is made up of wonderful Christians. And by nature, the military can put us in harm's way, where the thought of actually ending up in heaven sooner than that later comes often and is very real, and in the end, very comforting. At one military assignment, I was invited to participate with some Protestant friends from my squadron and spend some evenings together studying Rick Warren's purpose-driven life. It was a great experience where we really focused on his message and discussed how we carry our Christian beliefs in everyday life. We are all at different points in our faith journey. And I feel like mine is just beginning again. This time more completely, as I can now speak of Christianity anywhere, and especially at work. How refreshing. Whitworth goes beyond just allowing these conversations. It promotes them, and it even requires them. First, writing a professional statement on my Christian faith as an application requirement for this position was a real eye-opener and an exercise I took seriously and completed carefully. After two years at Whitworth, I know that my personal statement would be much more complete and explicit. Additionally, from the Board of Trustees statement on Whitworth, Whitworth's University's denominational relationship dated April 12, 2013, Whitworth will emphasize its ecumenical identity. It states, Whitworth embraces Christian ecumenism one of Whitworth's greatest strengths is its community of staff and faculty who guide and direct Whitworth's educational mission from a diversity of Orthodox Christian traditions, even those outside of Reformed and Evangelical traditions. It goes on to say, 
The dynamic nature of denominationalism is not likely to subside anytime soon, nor are the controversial issues painfully and regretfully tear at the fabric of Christ's one holy Catholic small c and apostolic church. I appreciate Adrian's words on diversity and the challenges it presents, but I agree that there are fundamental truths on which we should all focus. I was surprised to learn that some of my fellow respondents and presenters are Catholic like me, and that's a good thing that it surprised me. My point here is that Whitworth, we don't focus on denominations. We know that our faculty and staff are all unified through belief in the centrality of Christ, and that's the point of ecumenism, right? In facility services, I am blessed with such a humble and hardworking staff. If you know many of us, you know that we are predominantly an introverted bunch preferring to interact one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, and we like to get things done. One of our traditions is to open our safety meeting with a devotional where some of our many strong believers share intimate and inspiring thoughts. This experience has given us the opportunity to share very personal thoughts in scripture with our fellow Christians, which in essence is praying together as one Christian church. We don't focus at all on denominations or differences. We focus on the central truths of our Christian faith. Some people think we may be naive because we don't necessarily know who belongs to what church, but isn't that the positive approach and at the heart of focusing on common beliefs? My opinion is that Whitworth is on the right path regarding ecumenism, and that in my, in my circles my first two years, I have seen a true appreciation of the Christ-focused service we all provide for this university. Sometimes it takes fresh eyes for an organization to realize how well they are doing. Let me be those fresh eyes. As one who comes from a previous profession where the freedom of religious expression was not allowed in the workplace. The mere fact that I was invited and encouraged to contribute to this conversation on ecumenism and that I am actually standing before you participating in it speaks loudly and clearly in my mind that Whitworth is on the right path towards fulfilling its goals. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your, your great remarks, all four of you. Really appreciate that. And so we've got some time tonight to uh, just continue this conversation, this, this uh, conversation as uh, Santa called it. So I'd just call on any of you, if you have a question, to please make yourself known. We do have two microphones here. Um, if you prefer to speak from your seat, that's fine, but I would ask if our respondents could just repeat the question into the microphone, if you could, please. So questions for, for our panelists tonight. Uh, how should we view obedience to Christ through the lens of ecumenism? Uh, thank you, Mark, for the question on the obedience to Christ and what it really means. Uh, my understanding of obedience to Christ um, is uh, primarily an obedience to uh, a call to self-surrender, to give of yourself to another person, to, to see that person as made in the same image and likeness of God as we are or I am. So that, that is what it means primarily, a giving of yourself to another person. And that is the obedience to Christ, because as Jesus Christ has shown, you know, he went and obeyed himself uh, to the Father and died on the cross. Um, there's no greater gift than to give your life to another person. So that is what it means for me. Good enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the benefits of a community that focuses on ecumenism is that, as some of you have stated, we can focus on those things that bind us, that unify us. And that's very important. But as I think Dale has mentioned, uh, part of ecumenism is also a robust uh, conversation around difference as well. And I think all of you have framed that conversation in the kinds of attributes and virtues that it should remain in. How do we balance this uh, 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 concept of ecumenism focusing on unity, but not lose uh, some of the very important differences historically from uh, of our faith traditions that some of us are from? 
Good job. <laughs> um, I will, obviously I'm here to speak to it from a student's perspective, um, and I guess with all due respect to my colleagues from a generational perspective too. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna keep talking about um, um, I know that I was raised about as denominationally rooted as you could possibly be. I was raised by two Peace USA pastors who were raised in Presbyterian homes, and I mean, it just you know goes back. And uh, I've said my entire life that I'm just not tied to that tradition. I'm very, very thankful for my Presbyterian roots. That's taught me a lot. It certainly is what brought me to Christ, <laughs> and I'm so thankful for that but i think a lot of my peers would agree with me at least in the conversations that i've had on a student level here that i'm not as interested with that if somebody believes in consubstantiation or transubstantiation not to say that that doesn't matter but um i guess really pushing that ecumenical element and that unity element i would say another thing is and i think this is a different direction I could have taken with my remarks, but um, I, as somebody who deeply, deeply loves the church, also looks at it and look and says, what are you doing? Like, it's a mess in, in some instances, and I see more division, and to, I guess to use the, the statistical term millennial, um, like to a millennial like myself and to I think many of my peers, that is just a, um, that's a turn off. And we want to see Christ glorified and we want to see um, this gospel of love transcend the many, many boundaries that bind us. Um, but that's not necessarily at the front, forefront of our minds. Now, that being said, I love, I mean, I'm just going to speak to specifically Jerry's classes in Christian history. I love hearing about the history and the the roots that these traditions have. And that's not to say that they don't have value or we should just completely erase them. But um, I, yeah, I, I guess I just keep echoing, seeking to unite above them. Well, this is a big issue for me, Dale, because I teach this stuff, you know. And uh, I actually, I talked about this with my students, including Sana. I think she was in class that day. <laughs> she always attends. On why, why, why the second half of my year-long course in the history of Christianity is just harder to sell than it used to 20 years ago. Uh, it's been a real mystery to me. Uh, when I first started teaching here, Reformation and on was uh, more um, compelling to students. They could identify with more, they brought more to it, more curiosity. Um, that more had been catechized. I mean, you ask questions now, how many of you have uh, studied a catechism? And very few hands go up. All right, so a couple here. <laughs> You're ruining my argument, just be quiet, please. <laughs> When I ask them how many were raised in traditional hymns, you know, Dale, very few hands go up now. Will you stop that, please? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. No, I'm serious. Um, and so the, the, the greater curiosity now, the greater motivation and interest is in my first course on the early Christian history. They're deeply, deeply attracted to the uh, primary literature and to the liturgy and practices and prayers of that period, and less so the Reformation period, it's hard to sell. Because I think they're more interested in not just what unites, but in the deeper roots, the root system of the Christian movement, incarnation and uh, crucifixion and resurrection and Pentecost, and those cluster of ideas over which the church fought so valiantly and sometimes vessely in that early Christian period. Having said that, I love what the Apostle Paul says when he's uh, dealing with the, the parties in the church in Corinth, the Peter party, Apollos party, Paul party, and Christ party. And at the end of that section, he says, all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos and Peter, all things are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ's is God's. And I think 
we need to think strategically about how to reintroduce the richness of the Christian family of faith in ways that are more attractive, compelling, inviting, and not um, uh, divisive. So they can see there's a menu of not just theological traditions, but practices. I find that my students are more interested in this at Tall Timber when they're seeing the connection between a belief system and a practice than simply a set of doctrinal ideas. And that may be a way to do this, Dale, is to go back and introduce a, a more holistic way of understanding these various families within the Christian faith rather than simply an argument about a particular theological issue. I don't know. That may be one way of doing it. I'm sure there are many others, too. Um, I, I could answer this maybe from a staff perspective. Um, we don't necessarily have uh, the opportunity uh, on a, a daily basis to engage in conversation uh, about faith and, and share either similarities or differences. Um, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to have these conversations, uh, perhaps as you know, the, the next level uh, goes a little deeper in these three identities. Um, and also to be very deliberate about providing the opportunity to have these discussions. I, I do appreciate Brian Benzel, um, former VP of Finance and Administration, who we had a series of courageous conversations with uh, his direct reports. And it was the first time I had done that type of sharing with my peers at work. Um, you know, we, so it was basically focused on diversity. But, but an element of that was to tell your story uh, up front. And so each of us shared our story one or two a week. And it was very interesting because the, the differences would come out of you know, whatever denomination they're raised in. Uh, but then also the similarities and how they arrived at Whitworth was pretty intriguing as well. So from, from a staff perspective, I think we need to be very deliberate and either make those opportunities or uh, expect them, I guess. One, one other comment is uh, singing. I love to sing hymns in my classes because that is a way of, of sort of introducing and capturing at least some of the characteristics of a particular tradition, whether it's the Lutheran, uh, early Lutheran music of Paul Gerhardt or Philip Nicolai, or uh, medieval hymns or gospel hymns, Wesley hymns, which we just sang a couple of weeks ago. That is another, I think, small way of capturing at least some of the richness of these various traditions. Well, part of what's behind Dale's question, he and I have read several books together and talked about the notion that as a Christian university, those institutions over time that have withstood the test of time and retained their Christ-centeredness have been those that are most intentional about understanding what it means to be a Christian university and even deeper, the, the root uh, beliefs and values that, that really transcend and inform all of what we do here on campus. Uh, we ran into this last year as we were uh, engaged in this conversation around our denominational relationships. And one of the frustrations that many of us had who, was, who were leading that conversation is that we couldn't get students engaged. Staff and faculty, trustees, alumni, all seemed to be very engaged in this and wanted to have a voice in understanding uh, what it meant to be Presbyterian and, and, and how we could celebrate that and other traditions. But we couldn't get students engaged, and it was, it was most often a response of, well, we're not quite sure why this matters. But when I would start pointing out characteristics of Whitworth's ethos, values, culture, curricularly, co-curricularly, students were very quick to acknowledge, oh yeah, we like that, we like that, we like that you, that we have a courageous search for truth, we like that we lean into difficult issues, we like that we, and I would begin, we like that we focus on responsibility, and, Students were very quick to vote for those things, but they couldn't tie it back to our Reformed heritage and tradition, and they couldn't make that link. And so I think when you hear old people like Dale um, saying, um, <laughs> talk about a lamenting of, of this, I think it's because it's rooted in this notion that we want to be thoughtful and intentional about what these kinds of traditions mean for our institutions. Um, yeah, so that would be my response to that. If I, yeah. oh. If I may, uh, Dale, uh, thank you, for, first of all, for that uh, very profound question. Um, I speak from a Catholic perspective. It takes, uh, and uh, take a slight twist, a slightly different turn on this. Um, 
Chesterton once said that, once said or wrote that um, it's not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting, but it's that Christianity has been found difficult and not tried at all. Now, to be a Christian is not an easy to take an easy road. What, it, what I have tried to convey is that there is a centrality, a needs to be a centrality of truth. There has to be truth, which means to say God himself has ordered creation in a particular way, whether we understand it or not. And that is our task, is to discover that order in creation. Now, different groups of people may have different uh, sets of interpretations, even, even of a particular scriptural passage. But that's not to say that all of us are correct. We may all be wrong, or maybe just one person or one group is correct. Now, and so to be courageous in this sense of having a courageous conversation is to be willing to stand up and speak and uh, argue, debate uh, each other's uh, point of view. But yet at the same time, we can treat each and every person as individuals made in the image and likeness of God, to give oneself to another. So in a sense, I understand diversity primarily as a diversity of individuals along with the dignity that comes with a person rather than a diversity of groups to, to say that you're of this group or, or that group of that group or of some other group here. It's a diversity of individuals. And, and so to coming together doesn't mean simply uh, disagreeing and then um, holding hands and singing kumbaya or something like this. But it means to say that yes, we can continue to hold hands, but yet we will continue to discuss, present our uh, differences, and, and debate those differences too. And that, that is what it means to be, uh, in a sense, to be committed to the truth in Jesus Christ. How can Whitworth serve students who come from a variety of backgrounds, particularly those perhaps that haven't always yielded opportunities to think about um, faith and the kinds of ways we like to here at Whitworth? Um, I see a lot of nodding around the room, and I think I speak on behalf of many people here in saying that we're thrilled that you're here. Um, and that's exactly what Whitworth is, is bringing together people of different backgrounds, um, Christian or non, and hopefully uniting under this idea of a Christian liberal arts education, and we are here to receive schooling, um, but we have the unique ability to do that through a Christian lens. Um, and I think that it is necessary to have people who ask what may seem like, and by the way, your question about a catechism is not a, an obvious question, so I'll take this the wrong way, but ask sometimes the obvious questions that um, students who get caught up, who've maybe studied more, who've been raised in more traditional, um, tradi like traditions, denominations, um, they, they don't always think to ask those questions or think about what it is, I guess going back to kind of these initial thoughts that Dale brought up were um, thinking what makes me, me? Why do I believe what I believe? Why does my church practice this the way my church practices this? Um, so for you, I think you bring that to this community and say, why, why are we talking about this? What is this? And I think that betters everybody. That's not just you learning. That's the whole community. I learn from those questions. Professors learn from those questions. Um, I, I think that's just a rich, rich asset to the community, and I would never want you to think otherwise. I don't think anybody in this room would either. One, uh, one thing that I have seen lacking in uh, um, a lot of our discussion is really this commitment that there is this deep held, deeply held belief that something is true out there waiting to be discovered. Not just, you know, there's a bunch of differences that we all celebrate, you know, and feel good about it. 
Now, so it's a, it's a balance of understanding the experience of the human person, kind of a, a phenolo, phenomenological perspective, and also at the same time, on the other hand, it's an embrace of objectivity as well. So not to get stuck inside your mind, but to recognize that there is a real world out there also. Um, it is coming from a Catholic perspective to see every human person as, in, in, as individual persons made in the same image and likeness of God is essentially to communicate this message that yes, I love you just the way you are, but I love you too much to let you stay the way you are. It is an admission of the sinfulness in every single one of us. And so we come together and we pray together and we, but at the same time, we expect something from each other too. And the expectation is that each one of us will openly express our views, be transparent to each other, and we will discuss, we will disagree. But yet at the same time, we will do it all in a true form of love, which is a self-giving love. Not simply a love of feeling good, a fuzzy kind of love. I appreciate that too. It's a struggle for me as, as well, uh, Jim. I think there are two alternatives, neither of which seems attractive to me. The first you mentioned, that is a, a, such a severe mitigation of differences, you kind of come to a lowest dominant common denominator. And it's often culture that determines the terms, and you can lowest common denominator yourself right out of Orthodox Christianity entirely and turn it, say, into a political agenda or something like that. The other alternative is simply to glory in differences and to just kind of talk to each other. This is what I believe, this is how I live, this is what you believe, this is how you believe, and it ends up being a kind of cacophony of noise. The risk in that case is that the people who make the most noise eventually get their way. Um, so there's a third way here, and uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure how to get to it. That is the heartfelt way of taking on uh, big questions, theological, moral, and <clears throat> do it in a way uh, that holds up scripture as, as authority, even though sometimes we don't know what it means. And the centrality of Jesus Christ is the way that God has come to express himself and reveal himself to us finally in human flesh. And then roll up our sleeves and get to work. But I think there's one other thing that would help, and that is an emphasis on virtues that will keep us at the table and in relationship to work these things out. Uh, virtues, intellectual virtues like respect, um, humility, uh, those kinds of things that <clears throat> create bonds of respect and loyalty that help us work these things through over a long period of time. And those are Christian virtues in many ways. If we don't have those, I don't know how we can do this project. And uh, some kind of admission or focus on the authority of scripture and the centrality of Christ. And then we fight it out. Well, would you all, um, I'm sorry, we're, we're running late here. Would you all please join me in thanking our panelists? <laughs> Well, this does, this does conclude our, our, uh, our year's activities of, of exploring these three theological identities. Um, when I set out to develop the series last summer, I had several goals in mind. First, I wanted to provide the space for our community to think intentionally about what were simultaneous commitments to the Reformed evangelical and ecumenical identities and um, to explore how they animate all that happens here at Whitworth, in the classroom, in the residence hall, in the athletic field, in the maintenance shed, and across really the whole gamut of activity here in our community. I also wanted us to courageously lean into some of the real and perceived challenges associated with being an institution of higher learning that elevates these values. And I wanted these conversations to be amplified across the Whitworth community by including a broad and diverse range of its citizens, from the ranks of students, faculty, and staff, each of whom lives faithfully 
into Whitworth's mission to equip graduates to honor God, follow Christ, and serve humanity, but each of whom also sees the institution through a different set of vocational, experiential, and religious lenses. Even though we describe Whitworth's mission with common language, we do not all experience Whitworth's mission similarly. Finally, I wanted these conversations not to be just the end of this discussion, but to serve as seeds that would sprout continued conversations all across campus, addressing how Whitworth can truly take advantage of the unity we have as we attempt to live faithfully into these commitments. And so I look forward to participating more in these conversations with all of you. Let me end with this. When I was being interviewed for the presidency four years ago, one of the search committee members described to me Whitworth's mission as, a, and I'm quoting here, messy. I didn't completely know at the time what that person was trying to communicate to me, but I was immediately interested because I could tell that this person thought that being messy was an advantage, not a hindrance. My kids have tried to make that same case at home, but to no avail. <laughs> Now, I have to say, after having experienced Whitworth's mission firsthand, and frankly, having now helped to shape and protect that same messy mission, I know now exactly why that person was so excited. As a Christian, liberal arts, comprehensive university dedicated to both open and rigorous academics and to the faithful integration of Christian faith and learning, Whitworth hasn't chosen the easiest path for itself realize that it would be far easier for the university to live at the base of one of the two steep slopes that form the narrow ridge Whitworth calls home. The ridge that separates institutions that have jettisoned their Christian missions and those who have given up on their academic missions. That ridge that connects to Christ-centered academics is, well, it's messy. But to compromise our mission would be to sacrifice exactly what makes Whitworth special, if not a little untidy. More and more, I am persuaded that Whitworth's willingness to navigate complexities rather than retreat from them is what serves our students best. Even when some of us come out of those interactions a little bruised and a little skinned up. Similarly, that, that Whitworth doesn't settle to describe its Christian commitments in tightly woven and relatively concise terms, or to precisely prescribe through things like signed confessional statements how its citizens, employees, and students should view and express their faith or live it out, well, that too makes for a little messiness. But again, I'm persuaded that Whitworth is better, and therefore our students are better off when we allow for the genuine Christian expression of the university to be shaped by the diversity of traditions, experiences, and expressions we each bring into this community. Again, it would be far easier and a less messy, certainly, to describe Whitworth's theological underpinnings as either reformed or evangelical or ecumenical. But as we have rediscovered, I think, in this colloquy, to do so would sacrifice what makes Whitworth special and what strengthens us as a community of Christian learners. Let me conclude by reading the last paragraph from our board statement, which they published back in April of 2013. And I'm quoting here, the board says, these are volatile times for any church-related institution. The dynamic nature of denominationalism is not likely to subside anytime soon nor are the controversial issues that painfully and regretfully tear the fabric of Christ's one holy Catholic and apostolic church. But times of uncertainty, division, and rancor also give, uh, give rise to opportunities for leadership. Whitworth University can seize upon that opportunity by continuing to be a place that elevates Christ, puts profound importance on the study of God's holy scripture, bears witness to the grace and truth of the gospel, and engages in the noble enterprise of forging hearts and minds for service to Christ's church and to society. Whitworth is, can, and should be a place that elevates ideas, a university that is fearless and courageous in its quest for revealed and discovered truth, and a home to faithful Christians who share a love for Christ 
and a respect for the authority of Scripture, what I might call rather than the least common denominators, perhaps the highest common factors of our experience here, despite other differences. Christian in identity, reformed in theology, evangelical in outreach, ecumenical in spirit, and Presbyterian in partnership. May Whitworth, by God's grace, continue to provide its diverse students an education of mind and heart, equipping its graduates to honor God, to follow Christ, and to serve humanity. So again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for participating all year long in this series of conversations. God bless you. Thank you.